I want to welcome everyone back to our afternoon session. And I am particularly honored to introduce Todd May, who many of you might know or have taken a class with since he was visiting here in the spring of 2011. Um, so uh, Todd got his PhD from Penn State University in 1989, and he's been teaching at Clemson since almost then, 1991. Um, I, I can't read through all the titles of his books, but I can tell you I counted 13 of them. <laughs> so, um, which is incredibly uh, impressive on all kinds of things from uh, Rancière to Foucault to Deleuze to Nancy, Derrida, Levinas. Uh, um, and in, in between there, there's also a book on Operation Defensive Shield, Witnesses to Israeli War Crimes. So we get an, 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 a sense of how his, his philosophy and political theory actually gets very engaged and political. Um, as part of that, many of you also probably know his book, The Political Philosophy of, of Post-Structuralist Anarchism, which has gotten a lot of uh, play politically. Um, uh, and the other thing that I thought was, was great was to see the kinds of things that, that Todd teaches. Uh, uh, amongst these uh, are classes on art, anarchism, ancient philosophy, animal rights, and business ethics. <laughs> I mean, of course, among all the other usual uh, things. Um, and he is... Um, Really, um, he really brings together, I think, a lot of the Anglo-American and continental styles of philosophy um, with uh, also a very uh, pure political engagement. Um, and he is working on a new book right now, I think it's right, on friendship. Is that right? Just came out. Just came out. Okay, great. Right. So, friendship in an economic, in an age of economics. Is that right? Sorry? Friendship. Friendship. So, it just came out now. Yes. Too. So we look forward to his talk, Living the Biopolitical, Body and Resistance Between Foucault and Mario Ponti. Well, actually, before I start, let me, let me thank the organizers, Simone mm -hmm. and Chiara, for inviting me. Uh, uh, and thank you all uh, for, for showing up. Uh, and uh, I see there's a, a number of students that I had before. And actually, I, I, I saw some students that couldn't be here because they were teaching or, or they were sort of you know, a little bit further along. And I just thought to myself how quickly they grow up. <laughs> it was sort of a bit sad. Um, uh, so um, uh, I, 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 the paper's going to be, I, I want to say, about 40 minutes, which will give, should give us plenty of time uh, for discussion. OK, I'll move right in. Uh, in the movie Annie Hall, Woody Allen's character says that relationships are like sharks. They have to keep moving forward or they die. A quick search of Google reveals that this has something to do with the necessity of extracting oxygen from the water through the gills. That, that's the sharks, not the relationship. Right? No. Uh, in any event, it seems to me that French philosophy often operates this way. The French seem to write as though there is a necessity to move forward, away from the current generation, or else one will suffocate in its philosophical enclosure. Existentialism rejects neo-Kantianism. Structuralism rejects existentialism. Neo-Republicans reject structuralism and post-structuralism. And for some unaccountable reason, everybody rejects Hegel. <laughs> the claim of this paper then runs the risk of philosophical death, or perhaps even worse. For what I want to argue is that to obtain an adequate grasp of the biopolitical as it appears in Foucault's thought, we must not only not move forward, instead and indeed, we must move backward. It is Foucault's teacher, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, whose perspective we must take on board if we are to understand how the biopolitical operates in our lives. Further. And perhaps even worse, it is in particular his account of the lived body drawn from his existential phenomenology that we need. That is to say, in order to have a full comprehension of the biopolitical in Foucault, we need to turn back to Merleau-Ponty's early phenomenological writings. I am quite sure there is a special place in French philosophical hell reserved for people who make claims like this. And when I get there, I promise I will report out what it's like. Of course, the immediate and perhaps gasping reaction of many to this claim will be that since the biopolitical often operates at a level beneath awareness, and since phenomenology deals in what presents itself to us, the claim is a non-starter. And indeed, it would be a non-starter if it were Husserl or perhaps even Sartre that we were dealing with here. But Ro Ponty's thought is subtler than that. To claim that phenomenology deals only in what presents itself to us is to miss Merleau-Ponty's peculiar and subtle twisting of phenomenology, a twisting 
in which what presents itself to us already indicates that there is more than what presents itself to us. But rather than get ahead of ourselves, let's start instead with Foucault's treatment of the body so that we can see where the necessity to appeal to Merleau-Ponty arises. For Foucault, and especially the Foucault of his two most famous genealogical works, Discipline of Punish and First Volume of History of Sexuality, power operates primarily on the body. In the unforgettable inversion he invokes at the beginning of Discipline and Punish, he writes, everybody will remember this, the soul is the prison of the body. The body, we might say, is the surface upon which power is inscribed. Let's recall briefly some of the ways in which this inscription happens. In Discipline and Punish, bodies are gathered together in an enclosed space. They are then operated on by means of manipulation and surveillance. The manipulation seeks to make the body more efficient. Borrowing from sources as diverse as the timetable in monasteries and Prussian military training, the operation of the prison seeks to break down the body's movements and orientation, and then restructure them in a way that makes the body fit for society, and, and especially industrial capitalist society. Surveillance helps ensure the success of this manipulation. By watching how the body operates and how well or how poorly the techniques of manipulation are taking hold, surveillance allows for the modification of those techniques. Moreover, by subjecting a body to constant surveillance, that body is trained to surveil itself, to treat itself as an object to be watched over. Because of this, surveillance becomes self-surveillance and as the techniques of the prison diffuse across society, we become subject not only to the surveillance of others, but also, of course, of ourselves. What I have described here is one way of thinking about normalization. In normalization, there is a norm that is considered the proper or optimal or normal way of behaving, and all other behaviors are considered to be various ways in which one can be deviant right, from the norm. Or the, the role of human scientists, of course, is to catalog and understand both the normal as norm and the various deviances, and of course to break them as well. From this perspective, normalization involves operations on the body in order to bring it closer to the optimal level of the normal. The body, we might say, is the object of normalization. And inasmuch as normalization involves the creation of the modern soul, the body is imprisoned by the soul. If we turn to the first volume of the history of sexuality, things might look a bit different. After all, what is being described there are not bodies, but desires. Recall that the key shift in the confessional after the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1563 is from confessions of acts to confessions of desires. In Foucault's words, quote, an imperative was established. Not only will you confess to acts contravening the law, but you will seek to transform your desire, your every desire, into discourse, end quote. We might be tempted then to see the history of sexuality that Foucault suggests as a movement away from the corporeal toward the psychological and the discursive. However, this would be a mistake. It is a mistake not only because other examples Foucault adduces actually refer to or require manipulation of bodies, such as the separation of dormitories by gender, or the encouragement and sometimes discouragement of particular sexual practices in the wake of the rise of population studies, or the bizarre practices that arose in the late 19th century to prevent childhood masturbation. It is, in fact, a mistake on its own terms. To think there is a shift away from corpor the corporeal misunderstands the corporeal nature of the introduction of the discourse of desire. The shift from the confessional of the confessional, from a discourse on acts to a discourse on desire, is a shift in the interpretation of one's corporeal state. It involves a self-assessment of the state of one's body, not only in what it does, but in its particular orientation. Sexuality, we must recall, is for Foucault not the same thing as sex. It is a historically created, historically produced entity. But of what is it created? Our corporeal desires, imaginings, and orientations. And its creation is not a stifling of desire, in favor of a particular silence, a point that Miguel, I think, made really eloquently earlier. That would be the repressive hypothesis that Foucault seeks to refute. Instead, as he points out, quote, since the classical age, there has been a constant optimization and increasing valorization of the discourse on sex. And this carefully analytical discourse was meant to yield multiple effects of displacement, 
intensification, reorientation, and modification of desire itself. End quote. In short, sexuality arises not out of a shift from the corporeal to the psychological, but in a reorientation of the corporeal itself. It is indeed another way in which the soul becomes the prison of the body. This time, it is the soul as a sexual soul that does the work, starting from the Catholic confessional, and as we call self-notes, coming down to our time where its banner is carried by psychoanalysis. The idea that power relationships are corporeally oriented is also implied in his essay on the subject of power, where he comes as close as he ever does to defining power. There he writes that power, quote, is a total structure of actions brought to bear upon possible actions, although we're possible. It incites, it induces, it seduces, it makes easier or more difficult. In the extreme, it constrains or forbids absolutely. It is nevertheless always a way of acting upon and acting subjects or acting subjects by virtue of their acting and being capable of action. End quote. We should note here that Foucault does not limit his understanding of power to actions upon already existing actions. Power incites or restrains or seduces possible actions. If it is to do so, it must do so upon the body of the actor. Power is essentially corporeally oriented. Now, one might object here that power can be other than corporeally oriented, and in fact that Foucault himself describes how it is so. Isn't the creation of the modern soul the very movement away from the corporeal toward the psychological? Isn't the creation of something that is not the body, that is the soul, in order to prison, imprison the body. Isn't it the body that needs to be liberated from insidious relationships of power in order to be able to express itself in alternative ways? The problem with all of these questions is that they presuppose something that Foucault denies, right? the separation of soul from body. When Foucault calls the soul the prison of the body, he's not talking about something that is not corporeal imprisoning something that is. The soul is a production of the body, a creation that arises by means of the operations upon it. Right? Normalization and sexuality arise from corporeal ma manipulations, and the creations they in turn give rise to, from delinquents to perverse adults to masturbating children, are entirely corporeal. We might say that power in infiltrating the body gives rise to certain ways of acting and ways of thinking about those ways of acting that are themselves corporeal. They are ways of being body. This insistence on the corporeal as the object of power in biopolitics finds its formal expression in Foucault's famous discussion of biopower near the end of the first volume of History of Sexuality. There, as you all know, he distinguishes between, quote, the disciplines and anatomopolitics of the human body and the later regulatory controls, the biopolitics of the population, as the two poles of power over life that develop in modernity. The disciplines which is the central concern of discipline to punish, is specifically referred to as corporeal. The second, which emerges later, right, particularly late, well, later in the volume, uh, first volume of the history of sexuality, operates on what Foucault calls the species body. Our concern here is not particularly with the species body, but the individual body, that is, as it is directly manipulated. This is not to say that the biopolitics of the population are irrelevant to the individual human body. Regulatory controls and issue out into specific forms of manipulation of the body, for instance, China's one child policy that resulted from a desire to control birth rate. However, my focus here is not upon the species body, but its individual human manifestations. So far, our treatment of Foucault's discussion of the body places it in a passive position in regard to power. The body is the site of power's operation, it is the object of power. It is manipulated, incited, controlled, restrained, provoked, isolated, surveilled, and reported. It seems to have no role to play other than to be the vehicle of power relationships. However, Foucault denies that the body is entirely passive in this way, or at least he seems to. Here I am not thinking of the suggestive note in History of Sexuality that recommends bodies and pleasures as an alternative to the discourse of sex desire. Instead, the reference would be to an earlier passage in the text where Foucault lays out his analytical axioms regarding his approach to power. The last axiom is this, quote, where there is power, there is resistance, and yet, or rather consequentially, 
I'm sorry, consequently, this resistance is never in a position of exteriority in relation to power. This citation and the passage itself from which it comes are a bit elusive. Foucault's emphasis is on the idea that there is, as he puts it, no, quote, single locus of refusal, no soul of revolt, revolt that would constitute the outside of power. Essentially, he denies that there is something deep in human beings, untouched by power relationships, that would be the source of resistance to them. But if that's what resistance isn't, can we say anything about what resistance is? There are at least three options in interpreting this passage two of which are unpalatable ones. The first is that there's something in us that naturally and necessarily resists wherever power is operating. However, such an interpretation seems to imply an essentialist view of resistance that is at odds with Foucault's larger, more historicist project. The second one came up a couple of years ago in my class here at the New School that detained us for a good 45 minutes, where it was suggested that in order to engage in discipline, the body has to be trained but if the body has to be trained, then it is, in some sense, resistant to the power of being applied to it. This interpretation does cohere with Foucault's thought, but at the cost of any political relevance for the idea of resistance. If resistance is simply the resistance of an object that's difficult to work on, then the idea of resistance as a specifically political project gets lost. The reason for this is that political resistance seems to involve some kind of agency, some kind of collective desire or will or what have you to resist. What we need here is a third interpretation of the passage, one that allows for agency without being essentialist in character. Foucault himself does not provide that interpretation, mostly because Foucault does not offer a philosophical account of the body. He is, of course, primarily a historian. He works by historicizing what are taken to be, in his words, both anthropological constants. But if what I have said so far is right, there is a particular, if not anthropological, constant that runs through his genealogical works, that of the body. This is not, I should emphasize, a challenge to his thought. Foucault is sometimes interpreted as seeking to historicize just anything. If it moves, he'll historicize. It. This seems to be a false interpretation of his thought, and moreover, one that would render any history incoherent. The short reason for this, and we can get back to this discussion if we need, is that if nothing persists through history, there is no way of saying what follows what. Instead, what Foucault does is historicize certain seemingly natural characteristics of our thought and behavior, particular ones, but in doing so, retains certain less <laughs> controversial characteristics as constant. One of those characteristics is that human beings are embodied. However, Foucault says almost nothing about what it is to be embodied. This reticence might seem to be one of the requirements of his thought. Since the body can be manipulated in so many ways through power arrangements, shouldn't we refrain from talking about what a human body is? Wouldn't that lead us back toward the kinds of essentialism that Foucault is at pains to deny? However, Right. Fouc I mean, so Foucault's recognition of resistance invites us to turn around the question and ask, what must a body be if it is capable of resistance? Or to put it in another way, if bodies are the object of power and therefore the subject of resistance, what can we say about such a body? Whatever we say, it must involve the capacity to be responsive to the world, or else it would not be capable of being manipulated in power relations. And at the same time, it must be capable of some sort of agency, or else the idea of resistance becomes politically inert. Now one might say that there's no need for such a conception of the body, for deflationary reasons. That is to say, one could reject the idea in the passage cited above, that where there is power, there must be resistance, and say instead that sometimes there is resistance to power, and sometimes not. I find this claim plausible, but it doesn't obviate the philosophical challenge. For even if there is sometimes resistance, that means that a body is not always passive. But then we can ask, what is the human body such that it is not always passive? Although the deflationary view rejects the idea, rightfully so in my view, that politically oriented resistance is a necessary concomitant of power, it does not reject the view 
that resistance is at least sometimes opposed to power. To reject that, of course, would be to embrace an obvious falsehood, and we don't want to do that. So then we come back to the question of what a human body must be in order to be capable of resistance, and yet subject to the infiltrations of power Foucault describes in his genealogical works. What are the requirements of such an account of the body? First, the body must be connected to the world in such a way that it can be molded by arrangements of power. Second, those connections are such that they are not always, or perhaps even not often, transparent. Third, it must be an embodied mind, or if you can stand the term, an enminded body, so that particular mental characteristics or orientations can arise on the basis of power relationships that take the body as an object. And yet, fourth, it must be capable of some sort of agency that can take the form of resistance. What we have described here, of course, is the body, as Merleau-Ponty conceives it in Phenomenology of Perception, an embodied mind that is immediately bound to the world and yet capable of stepping back from the immediacy of that bond in order to consider its place. Now, in order to, in order to press this point, I could at this moment take one of two approaches. The first approach, which I have decided against, would be to read you the phenomenology of perception in its entirety, <laughs> in order for those of you who are not familiar with the text to recognize the Foucaultian body it describes. The second approach, which I will in fact adopt, is to pull out a couple of familiar quotes, briefly consider an objection, and then turn toward a term that might be less familiar to you from a later lecture series <coughs> Foucault uh, Merleau-Ponty gives in order to make the, uh, the connection explicit. That is that the second approach will, I hope, do the same work as the first while leaving you the opportunity to pursue your various interests over the rest of the semester. <laughs> Merleau-Ponty writes, quote, man, taken as a concrete being, uh, is not a psyche joined to an organism, but the movement to and fro of existence, which at times allows itself to take corporeal form, and at others moves toward personal acts, end quote. Let's consider this quote in its entirety. It arises at the end of his famous discussion of the phantom limb, in which he seeks to show that neither rationalism nor empiricism can account for such a phenomenon. His own account is roughly that the body takes up a certain orientation toward the world, one that sediments in the body. The loss of a limb does not immediately allow for a different orientation of the body. That takes time. And during that time, the body lives what might be called a frustrating existence of seeking unsuccessfully to live the world to a wholeness it no longer possesses. As the body gradually sediments the new orientation, the phantom then recedes. Thus, Merleau-Ponty concludes that the body is not simply a vehicle through which the world is filtered to the brain, but instead a conscious and active co-constitutor, I'm going to revisit that term co-constitutor, of the world. The body is conscious. To be sure, it does not possess at the level of immediate perception the reflective self-awareness of what in the citation he calls personal acts. But the self-consciousness that underwrites those acts is not divorced from the corporeal and, its immediate, and immediate perception either. Reflective self-awareness, which Merleau-Ponty addresses only suggestively throughout much of his work, is grounded in our corporeal relation to the world. Not only does reflective self-awareness emerge from our immediate corporeal relation to the world, in addition, that relation cannot be rendered entirely transparent. There's always more going on in our perceptual relation to the world than can be made <coughs> explicit in any given moment. The most obvious example of this, not the subtlest, is the figure ground relation. When we look at something, there is an entire background that is being perceived but not focused on. It sediments within <coughs> us without our being aware of it. This does not mean that we cannot become aware of it. We can and shift our gaze. But when we do, other elements of the perceptual field become background, being perceived, but not explicit. Or we could turn to Merleau-Ponty's view of psychoanalysis. Although he has a closer affinity to psychoanalysis than I would prefer, his adoption and reinterpretation of its themes opens the structure of his thought to types of power arrangements described by Foucault. He writes the quote, Merleau-Ponty, as psychoanalysis shows, <coughs> the lost memory is not, is not accidentally lost. 
It is lost rather insofar as it belongs to an area of my life which I reject, insofar as it has a certain significance, and like all significances, this one exists only for someone. Forgetfulness is therefore an act. I keep the memory at arm's length as I look past the person whom I do not wish to see. We discover in this way that the sen that sensory messages or memories are, express are expressly grasped by us only insofar as they adhere generally to that area of our body and our life to which they are relevant, end quote. Or, as he comments in the preface to another writer's book on psychoanalysis, uh, again, phenomenology and psychoanalysis are not parallel. Much better, they are both aiming toward the same latent, end quote. The broad idea here, that the body's sediments more than consciousness can be aware of, is the source of Merleau-Ponty's famous quotation in the preface to the phenomenology that, quote, the most important lesson of the reduction, which reduction teaches us, is the impossibility <coughs> of a complete reduction. That is to say, the phenomenological reduction to pure givenness reveals that what is lived cannot be entirely given to consciousness. Our living, because it is grounded in a corporeal relation to the world, cannot ever become entirely transparent to reflective consciousness. We live a relation to the world that is wider than our self-conscious one. And that wider relation to the world, the one that Merleau-Ponty refers to in the citation as existence and elsewhere as being in the world, sediments themes and orientations and norms from the world that become part of how it lives even when it is not aware of doing so. This is a point worth emphasizing because it's often missed in criticisms of existential phenomenology. Later critics of existential phenomenology charge it with an excessively subjective orientation. Right. Uh, and to be sure, in the phenomenology of perception, Merleau-Ponty does emphasize what might be called the embodied mind pole of the mind-body <coughs> world nexus. This is because he's interested in perception. As a result, his phenomenology may seem to be grounded entirely in the subjective. However, while he approaches things from the subjective pole, the structure of his thought reveals that subjectivity is inseparable from the world in which it lives. There is no border between the two, or perhaps more accurately, whatever border there is must be a porous one. The world orients me just as I orient myself for the world. Or to put the point another way, our lived body is a body infused with the world in which it lives. The world pole of this relationship emerges in phenomenology perception only clearly in the final chapter where he discusses freedom. And there he concludes that, quote, the world is already constituted, but also never completely constituted. In the first case, we are acted upon. In the second, we are open to an infinite number of possibilities. But this analysis is still abstract, for we exist in both ways at once. There is therefore never determinism and never absolute choice. I am never a thing and never bear consciousness." End quote. In his Collège de France lectures of 1954 to 55, Merleau-Ponty trades in the term constitution, which he thinks inadequately captures what he's getting at in describing our relation to the world, for that of institution. In the course summary, Merleau-Ponty writes that, quote, by institution, we were intending here those events in an experience which endow the experience with durable dimensions in a relation to which a whole series of other experiences will make sense, will form a thinkable sequel or a history, or again, the events which deposit a sense in me, not just as something surviving or as a residue, but as the call to follow, the demand of a future." End quote. In the course of the notes themselves, which we, we recently published in English, but now a few years in French, Merleau-Ponty contrasts instituting with his earlier term constituting. Quote, the other is not constituting constituted, that is my negation, but instituted instituted. That is, I project myself and the other in me. There is projection, introjection, productivity of what I am doing in the other and of what is he is doing in me. True communication through lateral practices. What is at issue is one intersubjective or symbolic field, the field of cultural objects, which is our milieu, our hinge, instead of the subject-object alternation." End quote. With the concept of institution, 
Merleau-Ponty, as always, seeks to move beyond the subject-object or embodied mind slash plural distinction. The concept of constitution seemed to him to imply the integrity of the two poles, whether self and other, or self and world, and that they remain intact. They exchange with each other, but are not porous in the way he seeks to articulate. With institution, by contrast, there is, he says, a field upon which, a field which is our milieu, a common ether in which we participate and which each of us takes up. He describes that field as symbolic, as a field of cultural objects, and we might add, as a field of practices. For each of us, that field is deposited in us through our experiences, and we, turn, we in turn take them up and project our own future through them. Institution does not bar us from agency, a point to which we were return, but it does bar us from ever wholly escaping the cultural and symbolic field, or these terms, in which we are immersed. We are in the parlance of much of French thought, always already in a cultural and symbolic field, always already instituted and instituted. With the concept of institution, we can see the intersection between Merleau-Ponty's and Foucault's conceptions of the body. For Foucault recall, the body is the object upon which power relations operate. For Merleau-Ponty, is the institution of the cultural and symbolic field that is its milieu. The future opens out on the basis of a past that is not constituted, but rather instituted by the lived body. That lived body takes up, through its involvement in various practices, the norms that structure those practices. It does not necessarily reflect upon those norms. It's not always cognizant of what it is becoming. And if Merleau-Ponty is right, cannot be cognizant of all that it is becoming. But since the body lives a significance that is wider than its reflective awareness can capture, and since that significance is grounded not in itself, but in a wider field that it institutes, then one of the questions that must be asked is about the character and orientation of that wider field. What are its practices? What are the norms structuring those practices? In short, what are the animating themes of the wider world a body institutes? It is to this question that Foucault offers us some answers. To be sure, he offers us partial answers. He does not tell us what the milieu we institute is like as a whole. He tells us about its disciplinary aspects, or its sexual aspects. But if the line of thought I'm developing here is right, then there can be no single account of the whole of what is instituted. Because we are, after all, each of us, only a particular body. We engage in particular practices that compose only part of the manifold web of practices that is a particular symbolic and cultural milieu. And those practices interact in complex ways that no simple account can describe adequately. The aspects of our milieu described by Foucault are important ones, ones that have their impact on many different practices. Moreover, since his thought is motivated by political concerns, the aspects of our milieu that he describes will be relevant to our concerns of who we have been made to be and who we might want to be as individuals and as social groups. But, I would argue, it is precisely this and nothing else that Foucault is doing with his genealogies. He is describing aspects of the milieu that each of us institutes by being an embodied mind immersed in that milieu. Moreover, it is worth noting in passing that the genealogical method Foucault employs is also convergent with Merleau-Ponty's uh, thought about the body. For Merleau-Ponty, it is the norms, orientations, and behavioral patterns we develop that sediment in our body. It is though we can read the history of the practices to which we have been exposed by the ways in which our bodies live the world. To trace a genealogy is to trace the history and intersection of practices that give rise to a particular orientation of bodies. And a single body, inasmuch as it is the result of participation in and exposure to those practices and the power that inheres in them, institutes the legacy of that history in an individual form. Merleau-Ponty gives an example of such a legacy in his discussion in the chapter in the Phenomenology of Perception on freedom of, with a, 
uh, with reference to a person with an inferiority complex. He writes, quote, having built our life upon an inferiority complex, which it has been operated for 20 years, it is not probable that we shall change. This past, though not a fate, has at least a specific weight and is not a set of events over there at a distance from me, but the atmosphere of my present, end quote. In contrast to Sartre, for whom, at least according to Merleau-Ponty, the past has no specific weight at all, Merleau-Ponty insists that our bodies commit themselves to one degree or another to what has sedimented itself in them. But also, in contrast to determinist views, the improbability of change is not the impossibility of change. For a body to be oriented toward an inferiority complex is not for it to have the rails of its life laid out for it. Rather, it is for a body to be pressed in a certain direction, whether that direction is one of an inferiority complex or imprisonment by a soul. In his lectures on institution, Merleau-Ponty returns to this idea. Contrasting human and non-human institution, he writes, he asks, and of course, this indicates sort of an earlier view of, of non-human animals that laws have been overcome. Quote, what defines human institution? A past which creates a question, puts it in reserve, makes a situation that is indefinitely open. Therefore, at once, the human is more connected to his past than the animal and more open to its future, end quote. Why more connected? Because rather, at least in Bellefontaine's eyes, than being bound to its innate instinct, our specific pasts, our histories, are carved into our bodies and our behavior. We take up our pasts and our corporeal orientation to the world, a corporeal orientation that is also a cognitive one. But why more open to the future? Again, because we are not as bound to instinct. Our pasts give us, among other things, what Merleau-Ponty has called a symbolic field, and here calls a symbolic matrix, through which we can consider our pasts, the ways we have been made, and can become, as he puts it, open to the future. Right? This opening is not infinite. It is, as he says, indefinite. We don't know how open we can be to the future. The person whose inferiority complex has been drilled into them from childhood has a less open future, at least along that dimension, than the person who suffers a short period of setbacks later in life. And a person who has spent much life deep in what Foucault calls the carceral archipelago, moving from carceral institution to carceral institution, constantly surveilled and intervened upon, is more likely to think of himself or herself in normalized terms than someone who is not. This is not to say that he or she will become normal. Recall that delinquency is also a consequence of disciplinary approaches. It is said to say that is much more likely probable, in Royal Ponty's terms, that his or her corporeal orientation in the world will be defined by issues of normalization, abnormal, as well as normal. And here we begin to see the opening for agency, and thus resistance, that was our question. The body Merleau Ponty describes is not simply the passive object of its history and the power <coughs> relationships that history has inscribed upon it. It is neither immune nor reducible to those power relationships. And while it cannot escape expo exposure to them, indeed, cannot escape their sedimentation in them, the body is capable of wresting itself from the immediacy of its involvement with them. Unlike many non-human animals, a human body is only indefinitely bound to its history, which means that its situation is also indefinitely, not infinitely, open. And as open, it can in some way or another some extent or another, choose its future. But how can it do this? How can an embodied mind, subject to relations of power, enact forms of agency? Merleau-Ponty has opened the body to agency in his description of it, but we have not yet given a positive account of what that agency, and particularly that agency as reflected, might look like in the body he has described. Merleau-Ponty himself offered only a few quick sketches of what such an account might look like. This is because his primary interest in phenomenology perception, and indeed in much of his career, is in what he considers to be our first primordial relation to the world. For Merleau-Ponty, it is the pre-reflective bond that, with the world that is primary. And that bond, while not bound to its immediacy, 
does not exhibit the full-blooded kind of agency that we would think necessary for an account of resistance. <coughs> that, uh, uh, that is the kind of agency associated with in much of traditional thought about free will and reason as opposed to instinct and uh, desire or inclination. Just to be clear, what is needed here is some recognition of how there might be a place on Merleau-Ponty's view of the embodied mind for the kind of agency that would ground resistance. We do not need Merleau-Ponty to solve the free will determinism debate. Although it would be nice if he could do that as well, that most intractable philosophical problem is beyond the scope of our duties here, thankfully. What we need is simply a sense of how an embodied mind that is one pole of a body world nexus could exhibit the kind of agency that would allow it to remove itself or challenge particular norms or orientations that its environment presses upon it. Human bodies, let us recall, exist in a symbolic field or matrix. We have language, and related to this, we have a reflective ability that allows us to use language in regard to our experience. We can abstract ourselves from the immediacy of our pre-reflective engagement in the world in order to make that pre-reflective engagement an object of our thought. This does not mean that we can exit from that engagement. Any reflection we engage in remains bound to our pre-reflective corporeal bond with the world. In discussing the construction of a geometrical concept of a triangle, Merleau-Ponty says, quote, the construction possesses a demonstrative value because I can cause it, because I cause it to emerge from the dynamic formula of the triangle. It expresses my power to make apparent the sensible symbols of a certain hold on things, which is my perception of the triangle's structure. It is an act of the productive imagination and not a return to the internal idea of the triangle, end quote. We remove ourselves from the immediacy of the world, not by leaving our bodies behind and entering into a realm of platonic forms, but by using language and the reflective power of our bodies in order to see where we have been, what we have been made, how we have behaved, what we have perceived, and what we have thought. As Merleau-Ponty puts the point, quote, in relation to what we are by reason of our acquisitions and this pre-existent world, we have a power of placing in abeyance, and that suffices to ensure our freedom of determinism, end quote. One might object here that such a view, tied as it is, to receive language or a set of languages and to the pre-reflective experience from which it emerges does not offer us enough distance to be able to resist the practices that mold us. That would be true, however, only if what were necessary were for us to be able to resist all of those practices. But that is not necessary. We need only to resist some of them, or even just some of the norms of some of them. But what is often, to use Foucault's term, intolerable, is not the world in its entirety, but certain aspects of it. If it were the entire world that were intolerable, then we would indeed need to remove ourselves from our pre-reflective engagement with the world altogether. But that idea is, on the view we are discussing here, not even coherent. If who we are is inseparable from our engagement in the world, then the very idea of intolerability requires us to have a normative orientation, I don't think I like that idea, but I think it is, a normative orientation that is grounded on that engagement. Our norms, even our critical norms, do not come from nowhere. We do not resist our world in total, but certain aspects or practices or structures. And we do so in the name of norms that themselves are grounded in, or at least related to, it, norms that are grounded in that same world. In order to illustrate this, we can turn toward an example of this reflective putting in abeyance, Merleau-Ponty's term, one that seeks to ground resistance. That is the example of doing a genealogy. What does a genealogy do? It utilizes the symbolic matrix of a particular culture or society in order to show how certain assumptions about natural human ways of being are in fact historically I want to use the term instituted. Moreover, they're instituted by ways in which human beings are subject to particular practices, practices that inscribe power relations on their bodies. And moreover still, those inscriptions are often unrecognized 
by the participants in those practices, which is why a genealogy might be helpful in order to display the inscriptions for the rest of us to see. But a genealogy does even more than that, at least in Foucault's hands. Foucault's genealogies are critical. They don't just trace any old assumptions about natural human ways of being. They trace assumptions that limit alternative ways of being and that often intersect with other practices that are themselves oppressive in one fashion or another. That is to say, Foucault offers genealogies of assumptions about natural human ways of being whose power arrangements are intolerable. But where might the judgment come from that one or another power arrangement is intolerable? As Foucault himself notes, power arrangements are everywhere. How do we distinguish the tolerable from the intolerable ones? It isn't enough to say just, well, I don't like them. What has to be appealed to, once again, is what Merleau-Ponty calls the symbolic field or matrix. There have to be reasons for the distinction between the tolerable and the intolerable. Reasons that can be appreciated, even when not agreed with by others who share the same symbolic matrix, or even symbolic matrices that intersect with that one. This does not entail that those reasons have to be universal moral ones. That would be a discussion for another time. The claim here is weaker. They just have to be reasons that other embodied minds caught up in the same or intersecting symbolic matrices can appreciate as reasons for the distinction between the tolerable and the intolerable. If all this is right, that in order to gain a full grasp on the relation of power to resistance in Foucault's genealogies, we need to turn backward to Merleau-Ponty and, as I said at the outset, even worse, backward to his conception of the lived body. Such a conception, far from being grounded in a phenomenological subjectivism criticized by recent French thought, is in fact grounding for Foucault's own version of critique, and indeed for his very conception of the biopolitical. And so, Rather than wearing blinders that allow us to look only forward to the next big thing in French thought, we who study French philosophy might turn and look backwards periodically, and not simply to see what has been left behind. We might, in fact, look backwards in order to see what still needs to be thought. Thank you. using the word synthesis because it's a bit of a loaded term, uh, but a way of using both Merleau-Ponty and Foucault in a productive manner. Good. Um, I've read Deschateau. I'm, I'm not an expert on Deschateau, so I'm going to um, I'll say just Neither more. What's that? Neither am I. OK, so I can say anything I want. Um, the, uh, in my reading, I think that the, I think there is a, a, a real place for that. And, 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 and in good part, it's because we could say there's an intersection that Deschateau has with the intersection I was drawing here, which is around the, the idea of practices, right? Around the idea of, of what we might call everyday practices, right? The, if for Foucault, practices where the power is, and I think that, that that's, right, if, if Foucault has anything like an ontology, kind of, you know, or better, if, if there's a level at which he's analyzing, so I get, stay with that term ontology, right? His level of analysis, his unit of analysis is, is the social practice, right? That, that's where the power operates, right? And if Merleau-Ponty really comes to see in this concept of institution, right, that that's where the body is, right? Well, isn't this is what Sertot is Sertot talking about as well, right? That the lived practices in which all of this occurs, right? And, and, and let me make a, a larger claim here, right, that if anybody refutes me, and I'll pretend I never said, that the, um, I, I think there is an undercurrent in much of recent French thought that focuses without explicit uh, reference and reflection on it, on the concept of practices. Right? You, see, you see it in Bourdieu, but his concept of practice is slightly different. Uh, uh, but I think this idea of practices as everyday lived regularities right, uh, is one that there's convergence of a number of things on, including extra time. 
Any other students? Look at my students. Some of the guys. <laughs> To one. Okay, um, Todd, I really enjoyed the way you put Foucault and Mario Ponti in conversation. For a moment, though, I am wondering if we can put Foucault and Foucault in conversation. And what I have in mind is this. On the one hand, and I think as you so skillfully showed, there is this drive towards historicization of the conceptualization of the body. And yet, for example, when you look at Foucault's writings on Iran, um, he says that when it comes to the man in revolt, there's something inexplicable about it, and there's something that he's unable to historicize, and he says this is actually a moment out of history. It's actually a wrenching away and stopping the flow of history. Mm -hmm. So I, I find in Foucault this tension between, on the one hand, really theorizing situated practices resistance that are local and perhaps even reactive to some extent. And then when it comes to those like uprisings, these revolutionary moments, um, there is this tendency <coughs> to say this is just outside of history. So right. I, I was wondering how you would sort of tackle that tension. Yeah. Uh, let me start by saying, that in my view, and I don't think I'm alone in thinking this, uh, Foucault's writings on Iran were not his finest hour. Um, <laughs> The, um, he seemed to sort of get carried away, and in a strange way, right, get carried away into sort of uh, a, what's the word, orientalism, almost, right? Uh, that he was, uh, that you see actually in one other moment in his thought, uh, which is in the first time of history of sexuality, where he compares the arts erotica with, uh, which, there's almost a, 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 an orientalism going on there as well. Um, uh, and so, you know, once he gets kind of carried away, I think he, I think he works against himself. Uh, um, I also think, all right, that there are, because of his historical analyses, and because he didn't focus, right, on a reflection of the ways in which we are constituted, in which we have like a sort of a, a richer history that's uh, that's developed, right? I mean, and think here, I mean, just you know, for one example, right, uh, Professor Cavarera's discussion of narrative, another way, right, in which we get told who it is that we are that sediments right, within us. Right? Uh, I think that, that in order to center some of this in a way that gets us, um, that can get us away from what I would just call a mistake that Foucault made, there's something in us that resists. Right? Uh, I think there needs to be a philosophical reflection on the body, right? on how it is, not that we are constituted, but to really use, I think, how it is that we institute Right, that which we live, right, and if we if we can see that, right, then I think we'll be tempted. Oh, we'll we'll recognize a place for resistance, recognize a place for uh, a reflective move, and by reflective move, it doesn't have to be cognitive, right? It can be emotional. There's various different ways that reflective move can occur, without right seeking for that place of resistance, right? That Foucault him, himself, I think, and I think you pointed this out, right at a moment seems to revert to, right? Uh, because I think at, there is a, an unexamined aspect of his thought. Right? Uh, and, and look, I mean, the, the people can't do everything, right? So, uh, so you know, he, he, I think by bringing in Muriel Ponty, I think that allows us to see how we can get away from the romanticization, or the, the things like that, without uh, losing the idea of resistance and agency. Um, Foucault always used to remind the reader that you have to pay attention to where he's speaking, to where he's speaking. One of the historicists, historicism, a historian who was a geographer and a political topologist, he spoke from spaces about spaces. He spoke, he read the archive, but he also realized the archive was one side, and he couldn't necessarily do it. So he never totalized the archive. The archive was a relation side and outside. He focused on archival apparatus like the prison, the clinic, uh, the asylum, the hospital, uh, which have also been inside and outside. And he reversed the Hegelian model of history by to focus on the um, temporalization of space and he focused on spatialization of time within enclosures. Within that particular model of the inscription and of the constitutive production of power, 
Foucault rejected any continuism of the body, and I would propose any continuism of a life force as well. Life forms are constitutive apparatuses constructed within historical and institutional populations. Uh, so when he describes the body, he says it's a volume of perpetual disintegration. Uh, uh, when he talks about power being applied to the body, he says it is an action upon the action of the other. So that is far from any uh, uh, presentation of a passivity of the body. It's an action upon an action of another. And Deleuze has interpreted that in Spinoza's terms, saying that the more the body is affected, the more it's capable of effect, and the more it's capable of affecting others. And we can also read that in the Stoicist uh, framework. So resistance has to come from within the apparatus, within the dispositive, within the gestalt. Uh, Ryan Sherman wrote a very interesting essay, What Can We Do in the Foucauldian Archaeology and Genealogy? He says basically what you can do is contest your point of insertion in a dispositive, in a power knowledge apparatus, but you cannot contest the fact of that insertion. You can contest the point of insertion, but not the fact of that insertion. So I don't find that you've made a credible argument. I think like many people who turn to phenomenology, there's a kind of latent ethicalization of the life form, which I find is, is illegitimate. Right? Uh, and does that deal with the, the kind of disjuncture between power as potestas and power as potentia? You know? Self-constituting power, the power that in its self-constitution has to contest and to combat and to negotiate and mediate an already pre-constituted power knowledge apparatus. So I, I don't see where the life world guarantees us anything. Uh, uh, I think the, the structure of, the exper of experience is a historical structure and is a discontinuous structure. Uh, and this is one of the advantages that Foucault really uh, introduced into this whole discourse that gets lost in American appropriations for Foucault who tend to appropriate Foucault as an opportunistic function, <laughs> functionist, right? You know, so institutions just opportunistically deploy bio uh, biopower because it increases their capacity to, to, uh, to hegemonize a, a social field rather than looking at the ontology, the ontological structure of a biopolitical apparatus in which both the guards and the inmates are, are mutually concerned. So I think that the, the notion of resistance has to has to account for the limits of the archive, the fact that the archive is applied as a kind of pressure point on terrains of, of anarchic social practices that are never fully described within the archival apparatus, and two, that they produce their own particular types of bodies that, yes, I agree, are capable of self-constituting power, but within a circumscribed point of the institution. Uh, let me say a couple things. First is the preface. There's, 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 there's a reading of Foucault running through the loose, right? And Deleuze's book on Foucault. And I, uh, without saying much more about that at this point, I think Foucault, Deleuze's book on Foucault is a really good introduction to Deleuze. Uh, uh, I don't think it has terribly much to do with it. Uh, um, the, as far as Foucault and the history uh, goes, uh, um, I didn't use the word life world if you mean by the term life world, right? A, a body that lives, right? Uh, a pre-predicated lived experience. Okay. Pre-predicated. Right. But now, this is the phenomenological reduction. Right. But if it is pre-predicated in the sense that it is below any sort of constitution, right? Both Foucault and Merleau-Ponty reject that. Right. The, what Merleau-Ponty has insisted upon is that, the, as he says in his institutional lectures, right, the symbolic cultural matrix goes all the way down. Right. So then the question is this, right? It's not a question of whether we act <coughs> within our own historical, uh, uh, within our context, within an element you called our archive. Of course we do that, right? The question is, in seeing that archive as historical, right, how is it that we come to see it that way? Well, to come to see it that way is to come to see it in contrast with a previous set of relationships, a previous context, right? But to see that previous context in contrast, and this is where I, I made that quick comment out, so we can come back to it, to see the previous context in contrast to the context in which we live, which is the only way we can see it right, as historical rather than natural, there have to be some continuities. Something has to be continuous. Right? If there's no continuity, and I'm saying the continuity is the term body, if there's no continuity between the earlier and the later, there's no history, right? because nothing has changed. Right? Was that? I disagree with that. I don't, I don't see how you I disagree with the model of linearized history. But I think that 
exactly that point of continuity is where you're extracting an ethical. Right, but it's not a linearized history. But, yeah. but that point of continuity is where you're extracting an ethical possibility from. No, I'm, I, what I'm extracting is that if you're going, if there, if, if in, for instance, right, in punishment, right, there are changes in the practices of punishment. That means that there are changes in the way the body has been uh, uh, is being treated in punishment. In order for there to be changes in the way the body is treated, there has to be a body upon which right, those changes occur. Right? You cannot historicize everything because otherwise you have no concepts on which to build. All you have is things happened before and things happened after, and we can't line anything up. And if we can't line anything up, we can't talk about change. Uh, you know, I, I really find it very, very interesting. I'd like to know my, my hesitation. Sure. You're, you're reading Merleau Ponty within a political context. Uh, it would, you're, within a political context, but I mean, after all, you wrote four books on political philosophy. Yeah. And you never accessed any of them. Now, you can't do everything in one talk. Right. It, it, is this throw up a red flag? If you're looking for something, you're looking for within the lived body, a mode of resistance. But when he speaks about political philosophy, he never evokes right. the lived body of this mode of resistance. I mean, so now the problem is, you, you, you cite from the institution lectures the irreducibility of a symbolic matrix. Now, I take that as having more purchase than you do. Because I think there is what, I mean, to be brutally frank, that what disappears in the visible and the invisible and the, the slight lectures is the body. Mm -hmm. It becomes flesh. It becomes a chair. Huh? So that to, to somehow look for the body as a place of, of resistance, it may be an interesting project, but I, I don't think it's most interesting. Okay, now what, I, well, let me say this, because first of all, I, I want to clarify, well, let, let me talk about the politics. All right. I mean, I didn't bring in the politics, but I didn't bring the politics for reasons that you already gave, right? The, the body disappears. But my claim, right, is not that the politic, the, that the body is the source of resistance, right? The source of resistance, right? But that the body is capable of resistance. And in being capable of resistance, we have to ask ourselves what a body is such that it is capable of resistance. In other words, I, I think I'm after something, something weaker, right? But that weaker thing that I'm after, right, is going to read from institution, we could say, if, if we're looking at Merle Ponty's trajectory, right, from institution backwards, right? In other words, as a correction, right, rather than as what he does later, right, which, you know, if we're thinking from institution forward, right, to the flesh. Right? Which is what I would do. Right. No, no, and, and, and that's, I want to say that's, that's a, a perfectly reasonable reading, right? Because I mean, this is, a, this is a, a transition period for him, right? But he brings in the lectures, he brings the institution in conversation with Constitution. And he's saying what... Right, right. And, he says, and, and he's saying where he thinks this goes, right? Now, I think he goes further along that path, right, uh, when he hits uh, the visible and the invisible. Fair enough, right? But I'm, what I, I want to do is I want to stop right there, because I think that's the moment where he captures the idea that he's had in the phenomenology perception in a more adequate way, right? I want to say more adequate philosophically, uh, more adequate conceptually, more adequate even politically, right? Uh, without that movement forward, right? Uh, and I think it's that, and it's that point where the, where the deepest intersection with Foucault is. Now, you could say, why, you know, why don't I bring in that, the other stuff? Because it's stuff that having to do with uh, what he was talking about and uh, I, and I don't think it's helpful, in, uh, particularly in understanding Foucault, right? So, I, Bernard, I'm sympathetic with the idea that you can read it forward. I think for the kinds of political purposes that help us intersect with Foucault, reading it backwards, uh, from backwards from lectures uh, uh, as a correction, I think it's probably just more fruitful for us. Thanks. Thanks. I, um, I, I just have a, a very brief comment followed by a very brief question, and it, it really follows up on the two comments that were made, possibly just a footnote to those two comments. Um, I, I too was wondering about the fruitfulness of the, of the analysis, given the following. It, it's, it's unquestionable that in Melodonti you have a thinking of the body linked with a rethinking of, of power. 
But the power in Wait, question. Wait, we'll continue for now. In in no continue. Okay. But the power in question is very much the ontological power that he gets from the second volume of the self idea, which is the reconfiguration of the I as an I can rather than as an I think. That it seems to me is very different from the question of. Unfortunately, in English, we use the same word, which is the question of puissance and no longer the question of pouvoir. So, je peux, I can, the sein können is very different from uh, the question of power and the question of macht. And it seems to me that, and that that's, that's the question of it. Given the significance of Nietzsche's thought uh, for, um, for, for Foucault on the question of power, and given Nietzsche's own understanding of the body in connection with the will to power, why is it that he privileged, why is it that he privileged the early metal body over the, the, the existing material uh, that that body, sorry, that Foucault discusses, in which the body is seen as will to power, as a form of appropriation, as a form of uh, as, as an intervention into a situation that is itself already uh, a, a network of power relations, and therefore as a far more, um, yeah, as a, as a far more interventionist and far, far more um, uh, involved in a set of relations than, 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 than in other. So on the one hand, I think particularly we have an ontology of possibility, on the other we have something like a physiology of power. Both deal with the body, both deal in a way with resistance, but in, in ways that seem to be very, very different. So, good. Let, let me, and let me work backwards, right, from the Nietzsche to the I can, okay? Uh, because basically, with the question of Nietzsche, there's a, there's a larger question we got to understand, which is, and, and I don't see how we resolve it here. Uh, I actually think that for reading Discipline of Punish and the History of Sexuality, Although you can see, uh, say, a strong analogy, say, between this one and Punish and the second essay in Genealogy of Morals and things like that, I actually don't think that Nietzsche is a good lens to read for both genealogies. Or, uh, I know this is going to be this is going to sound strange, but the 1970 entire book right, just come out. Right. Just published by no, 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 right, right. That's that. Right, so that's 1970. Right. right. I think I think I think things change over the years. Right. I think he's. I think he develops. Right, a set of notions that actually put an intention with some with some of Nietzsche. Again, that's a larger that's a larger issue, right? And I, I, I mean, in seventy for sure, right? But by 74, 75, 70, I don't think it's I don't I don't think it's quite that clear. Okay, uh, but you can see that's just a larger discussion. Now, to swing back to the I can, right? For Rule Ponty, again coming back to the answer to Bernard, reading through the notion of institution, right? I think the I can is not. For Merleau Ponty, right, the place of resistance, right? The I can is the orientation toward the world, the incrustation in the world, right, through action, right? Some often action that precedes reflection, that itself is instituted, right? So the I can doesn't give us the possibilities for resistance agency. I can is shot through with the uh, with the kind of institution that creates a body. Right? And I think I think that's there in phenomenology perception, clear, I think clear read through through the lectures. Right? So if we're going to see the concept of agency, it's not by counterposing Merleau-Ponty's I can on the one hand with say Foucault on the other, right? Uh, because I think the I can is already within the cultural and symbolic matrix. It just it what it flags is the primacy of an engagement of, in the world that isn't sort of a conscious partition. So we would have to ask the question of how the I can, right, can become, right, uh, can assume some sort of agency for resistance. I think that would be the, the way to approach it. And th it, once we ask that, then we're back and asking questions that I think will put us back in the I'm sorry, back in the Sorry, yeah, I think there are a few questions raised, and maybe we'll just take uh, take the three of them that are waiting, yeah. and then you can answer them together. I try to be brief. Um, I really like the idea to go backwards to understand or reconsider some of the Korean concepts. Oh, oh, sorry. <coughs> I really like uh, this approach to go backwards to understand some of the Korean uh, concepts. 
I'm not so sure about Bernard Conti. I think Combien might be a better choice to, to understand the list. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different so, angle. But. Yeah, but uh, in a way, what, what I'm trying to ask is what links up to, to some of the other questions as well. Because I'm not so, if, you, if you put it this way, you know, uh, the body as the object of power, and then the body as a subject of resistance, in a way, you, as I would read Foucault, this is not the, as I understood Foucault, you know, because if I understood him correctly, he exactly tries to evade this subject-object problematic, just saying, okay, there's the object of power. I mean, as you said, in a way, it's, it's a relational approach, it's a network of power, and in, in trying to use, to employ concepts like um, uh, instrument effect in uh, discipline and punishment, for example, or in the lectures on governmentality, if he speaks of the body of the population, yeah, he says the subject-object population. I mean, he exactly tries not to say it's the object, and power is something exterior that works on the body. You know. Power relations, they, they go through the body. It's not something, in a way, you, you evoke a concept of power that is not the Foucauldian one, Person. at least Person. at least the one that is the most the strongest uh, that, it, that you can find. Oh, you know? And then this question about the, where's, where's, the, where's the locus of resistance, you know? I mean, for Foucault, this is not the question of reason or to, that you have to find it, you know? It's just, it's, it develops automatically through the workings of power, you know? It's, already, it's always there, it's already there. And, um, and the last point I want to make, it's just, I don't, but this was already raised, I don't um, think that Foucault's concept of the body it remains the same. I think what he did, does in this lecture of governmentality and in his later work uh, on, the, uh, on the ethics of care and so on, it's, it's a reworking of his former concept of the, of the body. How can the body be the object not only of power but of ethical reflection and how can we work on the body through moral experiences and so on? So, it was longer than I expected. <laughs> okay, sorry. But uh, <coughs> suppose Foucault is uh, right, and indeed, uh, whatever we call power was uh, resistance, or the resistance, and uh, uh, we could think that perhaps his last set of vectors could be uh, read from this perspective, that they're different forms of what I see, or two tell in each form of two tell, yeah, each form of two tell, we suppose it's a particular way our uh, body is uh, trained to uh, resist. Power, but it seems to me, and uh, sorry, because my, my question to, as, a, as a good anarchist, you would probably hope that if our bodies uh, really come with certain effect of power and uh, we reflect on the uh, power constitution, we could uh, overcome. However, it seems to me that the model of uh, resistance is uh, always in the of pain, it's always imprisonment, pain, torture, something like this. But what if? This is my question. If uh, uh, the way our bodies resist uh, contemporary capitalist power is not pain but in German. Just think about uh, all the video games, uh, about the way we uh, even our computers, our airplanes, uh, and so on. If uh, our, uh, the way, this is the way uh, our body resists, and then it would be much, much more interesting. very briefly. In, I wonder if uh, in order to see for a place of resistance in Foucault, not in the very, very last Foucault, the one over Pimalea and two, but you know, the, the Foucault of uh, discipline and punish, uh, we had to claim that Foucault is a more an Aganian uh, than he would admit to be because it seems to me that uh, if there are places of resistance in the body as well, on the conception of the body, they are produced by the dynamic of power. So they don't have sort of ontological roots somewhere, but they are inside the process uh, itself. Uh, a second point, if we're to seek for a place of resistance uh, in keeping with my Mar rotten teeth, I wonder, Tom, if you if you would agree uh, um, 
even that the board is concerned, if you would agree to mention the topic of the voice. I mean, uh, the voice is just the material expression of... I think there's good stuff written on that. Yeah, of, of, of uniqueness. And this is what is a real resistance in the body, where the body is a subject. In the sense that um, the voice, the voice I'm uttering in this moment, which is the, the, the proof of my the material uniqueness, my uniqueness, in a way, no, in a way, it is, to be sure, <coughs> it is in the symbolic field, because I'm speaking, and I'm here. Uh, but on the other end, it bodily exceeds the symbolic field. Mm -hmm. And so, <coughs> First, I wonder if you agree with me that we could say the voice is a bodily expression of the contextual, but not of the historical. Of course, we are speaking in history and we are speaking in a historical moment, but the voice as a singular voice is more contextual. <coughs> and last, sorry. And last, uh, if if we look, uh, if we are looking, this is a very important point in, in your case. If we are, if we are, if we are looking uh, for some issue, for some, some criterion, in order to distinguish the tolerable by the intolerable, uh, this criterion could be the body as uniqueness. I mean, the, I'm very arrogant, and I know I'm not you know, <laughs> very much in keeping with my local key. But if the, the, to consider to consider the, the, the injury, the intolerance towards uh, the incarnated singular uh, existence could be the criteria between the what is intolerable and what is tolerable. Okay. So I'm very good people. No, no, I, no I, think, I think I got all three. Um, Good. I'm going to go to the one, three, two. Right? Uh, and, and I'm going to be a little quick here. Though, because what I said, that, that what I was trying to do was actually, by invoking the uh by invoking the term institution, was to get past the subject object, to start giving some terms that would allow us to think past that. Right? that that's because, that, or in that way, I think, you know, hanging out, of course, is a, a, a significant. So it's not everybody, I think, will know that. Right? But I think what Lula Fonte had done is, given us a way of thinking past the subject object uh, uh, subject object distinction that is in fact in many ways continuous with what Foucault is on about. Okay. So so by invoking the uh, I was actually trying to I think, move in the direction right, that, that you that you like uh, like that book to move. Uh, now Adrian, let me say there's, there's three things here, right? Um, one, the, the Hegelian one, right? Um, uh, I'm not a person who rejects Hegel. Uh, and I'm, sure, I'm not sure I'm a person who understands Hegel. Uh, um, what I would say is what I know of Hegel, right, that, that to see Foucault in a Hegelian light would be de depend a good part of how we read Hegel, right? If we read Hegel as, uh, as uh, e that each, um, each moment gives its contradiction, right, sort of a more reductive way, and that that contradiction gives rise to its to another contradiction. Then I think I don't think. But if we read the uh, if we read Hegel as, as claiming that, that situations have their tensions and that they can break out in historically contingent ways, right? That's to say, don't read them on the standard reductive reading. Then I think there's more to be said about the relationship between Hegel and Foucault. Right? I think I think there's, a, there's there's some interesting things that that can happen there. But it's it's I think a reading of Hegel that's going to be different from the reading given right, of Hegel as a, as a thinker of the negative, uh, as a thinker of uh, simply contradiction. Right? Um, uh, as far as the voice, I, I think the voice and the uniqueness that you talked about, of course, are they're, they're, they're not acceptable, are they? Right? That part of the uniqueness of people lies in their voice, right? They, we, we want to say that that's, that's part of how I can exceed experience, right? Um, and if, if, uh, if that's the case, 
then we might, one way, put the second, uh, the, 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 the two uh, last parts of your, your, your thought together, would be to say that there's a principle involved in the intolerable. Uh, the principle of denying uniqueness, right? That, that would be a principle. There's an experience that opens us up to the intolerable, which we, we could say is the suppression of the voice, right? So that there are two different ways of uh, approaching, I think, uh, the same idea, right? And of course, you've articulated uh, in your work, right, in those different ways. One would be, right, your third comment about uniqueness would be sort of at the level of normative principle. The second one would be at, at the level of experience, but they intersect, okay? Um, now, Dimitri, coming back your way, uh, and, and the reason I left you for last was that it allows me to tell just a little quick story, which is uh, about anar you know, anarchism and resistance to power. Uh, when I first gave it, uh, I was invited after the post-structural and anarchism book to a, to a conference that had, uh, it was called Renewing the Anarchist Tradition, put a bunch of anarchists together, they were trying to get them to think together, uh, and actually to do what anarchists sometimes don't do, which is to think. And, and, and so we were, we were working theoretically, right? And uh, there was an old anarchist who attended my talk, and I was talking about Foucault and power and how it links to anarchism. And the anarchist in the back sat there, and he, you know, he, was, you know, he was old, you know, power is bad, we have to overcome power. Uh, and he said to me, he said, I have one question for you. This, are you or are you not an anarchist? Um, and I was wearing my New York black, as I, and, and I said, well, I said, I'm wearing the team colors. <laughs> but, I mean, it seems to me that there's, there's a, that there is a tension within anarchism, right? Between this idea of overcoming power and, see, and then as sort of younger anarchists, those who've read Foucault, uh, uh, seeing power as not the enemy, but as, as the, the thing that has to be analyzed, right? If it's the enemy, then we can raise the question of pain versus enjoyment and this and that. Um, and I would say that, that I want to reject that whole aspect of the anarchist tradition, right? And, and, I, and I know that anarchist thought seems to be coming my way on this. And the reason I know this is because people are criticizing my work, saying, oh yeah, all the anarchists of the 19th century already thought of that. Right? They already thought of all the stuff Foucault said, right? Uh, and that's, I guess, when you know you're doing okay. Uh, um, so I, um, the terms in which that question comes out in traditional anarchist thought I'm, uh, are just terms I'm not comfortable with. And that's why, I, I, in a lot of my writing, I want to say we need to rethink some of the themes that have come down to us. Power is bad. Uh, do, we do we resist by um, um, uh, pleasure? Do we resist by enjoyment? Do we resist, you know? So I want to say, those are the terms that I want to, if I'm going to use the jargon, problematize, right, in the anarchist tradition in order to get something richer. Thank you so much for your rich talk.